Ephesians chapter 3. You know, that's funny. Here we are speaking in tongues, and that's about where we left off. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, we, we were studying um, the mystery. And uh, so I'll just type that in. Somebody, somebody sent an email. I answered them back. But they, they asked a question about the Bible truth or the pure Bible software. And um, they, they had typed in, what was it they had typed in? Um, I think it was armies. Yeah, armies of the Lord. And, or armies of God, maybe. Because that's not found. Armies of God, maybe. Why is it not finding it at all? I'll have to read the email. But they, they had typed something in similar to that. And they could find it without the question mark. But they, without putting the question mark in the search part. But they, when they added the question mark, the software couldn't find it. And they thought maybe there was a, a glitch in the software that it was, had some error in it. And I wrote them back uh, kind of quickly this morning, but I said it's not an error in the software. Um, we just, we don't search for punctuation uh, in the Bible. Um, I, I think that punctuation rules have changed somewhat between 1600 and now, as the spelling rules have. And so I'm not all that sure how if you went to search for um, something in the Bible and included where you thought maybe a comma should go or a question mark or a colon or semicolon should go, um, maybe the, in the Bible it wouldn't be printed out that way. Um, I can think of, I've, I've pointed this out before, kind of teasing Callie to um, outline some of these verses that Paul uses that are about five or these sentences that are five verses long and to, to outline uh, those and it would ju it's just very difficult to do and you would think that at some point in there he could have put a period at some point you could stop Paul and take a breath and say something else in after that um, so I don't know the rules from 1600 to now as far as punctuation goes um, we were even talking about differences of spelling between Americans and Canadians. They tend to follow some of the British rules of spelling. We follow our own rules. Down with the King George. So, um, it, you know, one Bible, one language for everybody, regardless of punctuation, because you never speak punctuation. You never say. Wherefore I say unto you, comma, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, colon. We never say that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's why that's there. It's not a mistake in the software. We just, they, she just didn't, and I never really thought about it until he brought that up. Uh, but I imagine when she uh, wrote this software, she did not include a punctuation search. So... Well, I don't know. It says accent sensitive. Oh, I know what that might be. There are accent marks in some of the words in the King James. That's what I think that might be. All right. The word mystery. Let's read in Ephesians chapter 3. It's good to have everybody here today. And boy, what a hot day it is today already. And it's going to be hot this week. So if you go to looking for Mike Hoggard, look for me in a cool, dark room somewhere. That's where I will be. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, very quickly, Ephesians chapter 1. Do we remember what that chapter primarily dealt with? Do we remember? Yes. God's plan. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Where would be a good place to look at? Yeah, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. 
Now he mentions the word mystery in verse 9, the word dispensation in verse 10. And I may tell you a little bit about that tonight. Um, I may take some time and explain that. So in chapter 2, does anybody remember what the theme of that one was? Anybody, anybody, anybody but sucking up Alicia on the back row. Go ahead. Um, old life versus the new life. New life. And now we're learning chapter 3, uh, which deals primarily with the mysteries revealed. Genesis, or excuse me, Genesis 3, Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the, here he is again, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, and that therein defines what a dispensation really is. It was given to Paul, that's what he said, heard of the dispensation which is given me, it was dispensed to me, and I am dispensing it to you. I'm giving it to you. So a dispensation, uh, I think, um, well, I'll explain it in a minute, but I, I Definitely, according to the text, a dispensation is defined more as what God has given to the apostles to be delivered to us men here, people on this earth, um, to understand the mysteries of God, to understand what God's plan was, what his will was, which we covered in chapter 1. Uh, and if we now that we have the New Testament added to the Old Testament, we can read the whole of the, the whole counsel of God and understand, uh, at least in a very basic, basic way, what that mystery is, what it's all about, what, and why God kept secret, uh, which I think we've already talked about. Um, he said, verse 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. Now, and I've pointed out that every time you find the word mystery or mysteries in the Bible, it's going to tell you what it is. It's not something that is still kept secret as the Catholic Church would have you think, or maybe uh, the Lutheran Church or whatever. Any church that believes that there is a, a secret known or doctrines known and understood only by the clergy, that those in the the lay people the laity uh the pew members they don't have it they won't get it they won't understand it or that we as the ministers as the clergy have some power that you down there you puny people down there will never get we have it uh when i watched um, a few lutheran church services i was taken aback i didn't i've never paid much attention but during that service that lutheran priest will say um, um a dispensation has been given me or something similar to that that god's power has come upon me to give me the ability to forgive you of your sins so he is basically says i forgive you I absolve you of all your sins, or I forgive you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it's a done deal. According to them, it's done. If the priest of that church forgives everybody in the church of their sins, their sins are automatically forgiven. Now, what if they don't, what if they don't want them to be forgiven? What if they're not repentant? What if they don't care? We know a lot of people that don't. They want to live like they want to live and do what they want to do. They don't want God or anybody telling them no or that's wrong, especially nowadays. Nobody can tell anybody that they're wrong about anything. And I just I just think it's very, very, uh, boy, I want to say borderline blasphemy. Uh, to say that a, the priesthood has the power to forgive everybody's sins in a blanket manner. Just they're all gone. And I just, I just don't, the Bible does not, it does not indicate that at all. Uh, but the, the Catholic Church's idea that only the priesthood, only the priests and the bishops and the, uh, the popes 
are given the uh, ability and the blessing and the right to interpret the scriptures properly, which is why you will find so many contradictions between church doctrine and Bible doctrine. Bible saying one thing specifically, while the Catholic Church says almost the exact opposite of that. God says, do not bow down the idols. The church says, um, bow down to them and pray to them because these are images of the, of the saint or the God or whatever that you're trying to reach out to. It's, it's almost the exact opposite of that. And it's because of that, the, the, ch the church fathers believe that the dispensation of the revelation of the mysteries are given to them only and not to the lay people. So you can read the Bible as a Catholic, but don't pay much attention to it. In other words, don't get anything out of it because you may be wrong according to the Pope. We can't have that. So... Uh, verse 4, how about, whereby when you read, you may understand, there, there's Paul disagreeing with what I said right there. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, Paul said, what I know, I wrote down. And if you read it, then you'll know what I know about the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should, here's part of the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. With who? With Israel. And of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. Only the gospel can make men of any group, whether they're Gentile or Jew. Only the gospel can make them fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise, only the gospel. And there are preachers out there who are preaching all kinds of wacky, wacky stuff that uh, I know, I know, um, oh, John Hagee, I don't know if he's still around or not. Does anybody know John Hagee? He is? He's older than me. Yeah. But John Hagee believes that Temple sacrifices will be restored to the Levite priesthood in Israel and that's how their sins are going to be forgiven. The Jews are going to be gathering up little lambs and goats and oxes and doves and fine flour and olive oil and bring it to the priest and by doing that they will once again have their sins forgiven. And I'm just going, uh-uh. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Can't do it. And, uh, but that's what he teaches. That's what he believes. There are others who refer to themselves as, I'll say dispensationalists, but there are different factions of dispensationalism. Some that I don't really have a too big a problem with. Um, I may not agree on some issues, but um, they're good men. They love the Lord and they love the Bible. And they believe that there's one gospel. And one pastor put it to me. It is um, how God dispensed his grace throughout different courses of time. And I, okay, uh, as long as it's one grace, one gospel only. But you have what are referred to as hyper dispensationalists who believe that you draw all these lines in the Bible and only some of the parts of the Bible are doctrinal for us in this, what they call this dispensation of grace. In other words, they say that we are totally, completely forgiven only by grace um, in this time period between uh, the time Paul came on the scene, not at the, not at the beginning of the book of Acts, not at the, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that that is for us because they limit their doctrinal views to the pages between Romans one, uh, and Philemon. Philemon is the last, after that, you, Philemon, you have Hebrews, which they say is not for us. James is not for us. Jude, 
the three Johns in Revelation, neither are the four Gospels or the book of Acts for us in the dispensation of grace. That we only get our doctrine of our doctrine for us in this time from Romans to Philemon, and that's it. And some of them have it in their doctrinal statement that that's what they believe. One church I saw, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You wrote this? That they don't believe that baptism is for us in this dispensation of grace. Believer's baptism is not because Paul didn't come to baptize. It's Paul. Paul's God. Paul is supreme pope to these people. And they don't believe. Let's see, what was, how was it they said it? They don't believe that they are sons of God. Um, I, when I read it, I, I said immediately, well, they're bastards then. Oh, they said that they do not believe that God chastens us in this age of grace according to our sins. And I went, okay, you just said now what Hebrews says. You just said you're a bastard according to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 clearly says that if you will not receive the chastening of the father, you're bastards and no sons. So they just said, fine, we don't, we don't receive chastening. And I'm like, you have set up, you have set up a situation where the pastor and the people of that church can get into the worst lascivious lifestyles that there are and go to heaven proud. And God won't chasten them. God won't correct them. Nothing. They don't have to repent. They don't have to be sorry. Nothing. I attended the funeral of a young lady, 13 years old, whose father believed that. She had, he's, according to him, he preached her funeral. And according to him, she was saved when she was four. And between that time and the time she killed herself, she had gotten off into lesbianism with some girls at school on more than one occasion. And on a Sunday morning, he outed his daughter in front of the church. And Sunday night come around, they lived next to the church. And uh, so dad and mom got ready to walk over to the church. You coming with us? No, I'm going to stay home. I'm not feeling good tonight. And she took her dad's shotgun, blew a hole in her chest. And he preached her right up into the pearly gates. And um, six months later, his wife showed up over here on a Wednesday night. And I said, what's going on? And she said, my husband handed me divorce papers, said, sign it. Get out tomorrow. I hate your guts. Kicked her out. She had to move. Ted, take the kids and move down to Arkansas with her mom and dad. And I'm just like, that man's evil. That man's pure evil. But he doesn't have to be sorry for anything. Neither does his family. Neither does the men he runs with. And I'm like, you are, you are making a mockery of the cross of Jesus Christ. You're making a mockery of the gospel of salvation. And so that is hyper discipline. So they believe that Hebrews, James, John are written for 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Jude, Revelation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts are written only for the Jews whom God will restore in the last days, but it will be, they, they are not qualified to receive the gospel of grace that's only in this dispensational time. That 
when the time of the Gentiles is over, they then will receive a gospel that is based, as John Hagee said, upon works once again. And they try to argue this. They say that um, only Paul knew the mysteries. Only Paul did. Well, um, Paul said it um, in verse 5, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. All the apostles knew it. They specifically point out Peter. And they say Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Ergo, Paul's gospel is different than Peter's gospel. Peter knew, here's what they say. Peter knew nothing of the dispensation of grace and the gospel as written by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. That Peter knew nothing about it. And they call it the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ gospel, which I'm fine with. But they say Peter knew nothing about it and he didn't preach that. Well, I read Acts chapter 2, Peter's first sermon. And guess what he preached? Death, burial, and resurrection. Acts chapter 3, Peter preached death, burial, and resurrection. Acts chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Acts chapter 10, Peter preached the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In every chapter he did it. Every chapter. Between chapter 2 and chapter 10 he did it. So to tell me that Peter knew nothing of the gospel when clearly he knew it before Paul knew it. Clearly he did. So he understood it. But then they go back and they, then they try to prove this. They say, well, Noah wasn't saved by grace. He was saved by works. He had to build his ark. He had to build his salvation in order to be saved. No. Before Noah ever built the ark, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, then we have Abraham. Abraham had, had to go and offer Isaac. He had to, he had to show his works so that he, and that's what James says. He showed his, he had works plus faith. And I'm going, no. Because God had already imputed righteousness to Abraham before he ever took Isaac. Before he ever told him to take Isaac and offer him up. God had already, because Abraham believed God and God imputed it to him for righteousness. It was already done. God had already selected him and saved him. And so they say at different dispensations, like Noah's, Noah's dispensation, the Abrahamic dispensation, the Davidic covenant, and they make all these covenants up, and uh, that all of these different dispensations, there are different gospels for these time periods. And I'm like, you're lying. You're lying. You're making this stuff up. You, you use it to prove a doctrinal point that doesn't have much basis in Scripture at all. You have to prop it up by adding these delinear lines to cut off out of the Bible parts of the Bible that disagree with your doctrine. So rather than change your doctrine to suit the Scriptures, alter the Scriptures to suit your doctrine. In other words, any part of the Bible that disagrees with it, just cut that off and say, well, that's not for us. That's for the Jews in the last days. Or that was for the Israel in the Old Testament. Or that was for David. Or that was for Moses. Or that was for Abraham. Or that was for Noah. Or this was for Adam. But it's not for us. And then they even invent one, as I said earlier, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. A pre-Adamic civilization where there was a dispensation uh, at that time. So they take the, like I said, they take the white area of the Bible between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And not only do they invent an entire world inside that little white area, they insert a dispensation a, and a different gospel during that time period. It's not written in the Bible anywhere. They invented it and put it in there. And these people, they, you cannot, it's like, it's like talking to flat earth people. You cannot talk to them. You can't convince them. You can't shake them of it. Um, you know, God does change people, I understand. And I, I just pray that God will change some people before it's too late. Because some of these guys, they're, they got big followings. And uh, usually their followers are rude. Very rude people. 
Uh, they don't mind telling you off and telling you how lost you are because you don't agree with them. Uh, somebody said of me that it's, it's so sad that nobody who listens to my target can ever be saved. That's not, that's, uh, my target has nothing to do with your salvation. Never did, never will. Amen? All right, thank you. All right, now, uh, let's get into some of the mysteries here. Uh, we had covered some of this. Um, I think the last time we talked, we were, we were looking at 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, especially in 14, uh, where Paul talked about he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Um, he speaks mysteries. But the, the, the idea is that those mysteries, whatever mysteries he's speaking, will never be known. Because they're in an unknown tongue that he's speaking, and nobody can ever know what they are. And um, I am working on a new Watchmen series. I just started it. I just, just came into my mind yesterday called The Fakers. And it's going to be about uh, people who allege speaking in tongues, people who um, are giving out new prophecies, and people who uh, do lying signs and wonders. And there's a guy, he's on TBN, he's nasty looking. He's got, he's a white guy, he's got huge dreadlocks. I mean, just big, long, nasty things coming out of his head. And he claims he is sinlessly perfect. He claims that he is, since God transformed him, he has never lusted after a woman ever in all that time. Never done it. And I'm going, you're a liar. You're a liar. Or maybe he's not lying. Maybe he's a sodomite. Maybe he's telling the truth. But anyway, he does healings out on, he does street magic, does healings. And he goes out. And he does tricks with people's legs. He gets them to sit down and you can make somebody's leg look like it's longer than the other one. And then he'll pray and get the Holy Spirit on him and he'll lay hands on him. And all of a sudden you can see both legs straighten up and everybody's going, oh my goodness, he's got power. Oh, he's got power on him. It's street magic. It's a trick. There's about half a dozen ways to do it, but it's a trick is what it is. And he's out there faking miracles. Why? So people follow him. Okay? And I, I've got some stories to tell on that. Anyway, so um, that's the tongues thing. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. Turn there. 1 Corinthians 15. Here's, here's part of the mystery that goes along with some of the other um, verses that we have looked at already. In Matthew 13, unto you is given to know the mysteries. Mark 4.11, unto you it is given to know the mystery. Luke 8.10, unto you it is given to know the mystery. In Romans 11.25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So right here in 1 Corinthians 15 is a follow-up to that mystery understanding. There, he, he doesn't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. That for this time, blindness, partial blindness has happened to Israel. They can only see one testament of the Bible. They can't see both. And as long as the Gentiles are being offered salvation, that will continue. But then, 1 Corinthians 15 kicks in. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Uh, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So here he's talking about the translation being caught up. Um, the rapture, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. That's what he's referring to. So that will, in essence, it will put a stop to the time of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles will come when the trumpet sounds. And we shall be raised incorruptible to meet Jesus in the air. The follow-up to that is 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, we sh um, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain. 
Now, turn to um, 2 Kings. 2 Kings 20, uh, chapter 2. Turn there. You have a picture of it. Of the end the, or the fullness of the Gentiles and the restoration of Israel. You have it in the form of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, let's see here. What does Elijah mean? Jehovah, I think it means like Jehovah is our God or our God is Jehovah. Eli is Elohim, El and uh, Jah is Jehovah. So our God is Jehovah. Eli Shah, uh, I'd have to look that one up. I don't know, I don't speak in the Hebrew or the French, so I don't know it. But in 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, we have the two men, Elijah and Elisha. God has already told Elijah what his plan is. He said, I want you to go by, you know, Elijah, he did the deal with the prophets of Jezebel. And he had them all slain. And Jezebel comes home, wants to know where all her preacher boys are at. And they're all killed. And so she says, well, I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill Elijah. I'm going to get him I'm going to, before the sun sets. Well, Elijah runs off, and that's where he says, it is enough. Now, Lord, please take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And um, God speaks to him in a still, small voice, but he gives him these instructions. Here's what you're going to do. I'm not going to take away your life. Here's what I'm going to do. You go by, and you're going to find Elisha plowing with 12 oxen in the field, 12 for Israel, 12 tribes. You're going to get him, and you're going to tell him to come with you, uh, there's some, I forgot there's some other things he was supposed to do. He's supposed to anoint someone to be king. Uh, and then we have in the book of second Kings, um, we have Elijah and Elisha, um, headed to the Jordan river. And, um, in verse two, Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Um, he says it again to him in verse 4. I will not leave thee. Um, in verse 6, he says it again. I, I will not leave thee. And they two went out. And then um, in verse 9, Elijah, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elijah knew what was going to happen. He knew it. Elisha knew it. Fifty of the sons of the prophets knew it because they told Elisha, uh, don't you know Elijah's going to be taken from you today? Yeah, I know. So they all knew that this thing was going to take place. And that, when I read that, it caused me to really question this idea of a, what they are calling a secret rapture. That it will, it's, it's appearing and it's happening will come without any prior knowledge of it whatsoever. And I don't believe that anymore. I know that Elijah knew, Elisha knew, 50 sons of the prophets knew. I know Noah and his family knew eight or seven days before the floods began to rain. I know he knew. Um, we know that Lot knew what was going to happen to Sodom before it happened. And he knew when. And, um, and he was saved out of it. Um, so I, I just... You know, I, I just question that now. I, I don't really think it's going to be to God's true saints. I don't think it's going to be a secret. I don't think it's going to be a mystery. I mean, seven days, plenty enough warning for me, if that's how God's going to do it. Um, or that morning, wake me up, God, okay? And tell me that, you know, by five o'clock, you're going to be out of here. Okay. Um... Anyway, and does God do that? Yeah, I think he does. I, I've told this story. My, my great-grandmother lived to be 101. She told everybody, she told all of her children, all of her grandchildren, that God had promised her she's going to live to be 100 years old. And sure enough, she did. Now, she didn't say that at 101. She said it at 80 and 90. Okay, she knew that God promised her that, and, and God, prom God did it. So anyway... Um, he says, I want a double portion. 
of thy spirit be upon me. Well, the spirit that was on Elijah was the Holy Spirit. So in verse 10, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. If not, it shall not be so. In verse 11, it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So Elisha saw that. So that was when he's going to get his double portion. Um, and Elisha saw it and cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. But after that, he did in verse 13, what Elijah just did. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back, stood by the bank of Jordan and took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, smote the waters and said, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. Boom. He's got it. So now he is Israel. He represents the Jews who now the, their ignorance or their, the mystery is over and their blindness is over. Now they, the veil of Moses will be lifted off of them and they will see the one whose face is shining as the sun. Their eye will be opened. They will see the new covenant that was promised to them in Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, they will know who Jesus is. They will know who the Messiah is. They will not have to seek after him anymore. They will not be saying the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They will not be saying that anymore because they don't need it. Christ is the Ark of the Covenant. They won't need a, a gold box, uh, gold wrapped over acacia, wood, which is thorns, and acacia trees are all over Africa. They will not need that anymore. They will have God's true Ark of the Covenant, Jesus Christ, right there with them. Okay? And he's going to seal his, he's going to seal them with that Holy Spirit of promise. And as seen in Revelation chapter 7, he's going to put the seal of God in their foreheads and uh, no harm is going to come to them. Boy, that's something. All right, now, uh, back to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So he mentions here the last trump. Now, let's scoot ahead a little bit or a lot to Revelation 10. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles there. Revelation 10. Here's not the last place, but one of the last few places you find the word mystery or mysteries. And it's in relation to, um, and we're going to be there in Sunday school before too long. Revelation chapter 10, it's, it's in relation to John seeing another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now, again, I, I still have not been shaken nor swayed from the belief that this is Christ. Or I will say this could very well be Christ. It matches everything that we know about Christ in both reality and typology. Christ is a mighty angel. He's the angel of the Lord. Uh, he is clothed with a cloud. He's coming with the clouds. Mary wrapped him up in swaddling clothes. And Job said that the swaddling clothes of the earth are the clouds. So there he was, he's coming in the clouds. And then um, he has a rainbow upon his head. E Ezekiel saw the rainbow over the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 1 and said, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And God specifically said, my, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. Jesus said in John 17, remember him that we're covering that, where he says, um, um, Father, you know, uh, restore unto me the glory that you and I had before the world was. So they shared the glory of God with, with, them, with themselves. So the rainbow is that promise. And the rainbow in the cloud is Genesis 9. God said, when I bring the cloud over the land, you should, the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And that should be a token of my covenant that is between me and thee. And uh, so that to me, that's Christ. He's the glory of the Lord seen in Ezekiel 1. He's the glory of the Lord in the cloud in Exodus chapter 16 when God gave the Israelites manna. Uh, his face was as 
as it were, the Son, that's Matthew 17. That is Revelation chapter 1, uh, where Jesus' face shines as the sun. In Matthew 17, he was transfigured, his face shining like the sun. In typology, the second time Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, he is a picture of Christ coming in all his glory, and his face was lighted up so much that they had to put the, that's why I said the veil. They had to put the veil over Moses' face because his face was shining so bright, people couldn't stand, they, Moses, man, well, we want to hear what happened, but man, cover that up. And the symbolism, we know that is, that's God putting a veil over the minds of the Jews. When they read the Old Testament, they cannot figure it out. They cannot see it. And I've studied Jewish Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism enough to know that they, because of that, because their eyes have been blinded to that, and a veil is over their minds, they have invented way out occult things. They brought in all kinds of mysteries from Babylonian, and Canaanite worship, and all these God worships and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it's evil what they've come up with. And it's all because there's a veil over them and they cannot make sense out of the Old Testament. They just, they cannot see that Moses is Christ, Elijah is Christ. They cannot see that David is Christ. They cannot see that Solomon is Christ. They cannot see that Adam was Christ. They can't see any of that. They see none of it. So they're blinded. So now if we look down in verse... Um, this angel, his feet as pillars of fire. What led Israel through the wilderness? One pillar of fire. But now that we have two testaments, it's two pillars of fire. Old and New Testament. Can two walk together except they be agreed? So now, in verse 5, The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, the Bible says that God could swear by no greater, so he swore by himself. Who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now we know that that doesn't mean it's the end of time. We know it doesn't mean, because we still have another whole thousand years to go through. Bare minimum. So what it means is um, that the time is up. The time of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles is over. And we're not going to delay the restoration of Israel any longer. Now look at the verse, the next verse. But in the days of the voice of what number angel? Seven. The last trump. When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So now, what, what we learned all the way back up here in Romans, that you should not be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now you see its fulfillment right here in verse 7 of chapter 10. That's the conclusion that I believe the Bible has led me to. If you look at the next chapter, chapter 11, verse, let's see here, uh, 15, the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. That's where, it, that's where hallelujah chorus comes from in part. Um, at this point now, now that the last trump has been sounded, Israel has been given, um, they've been unblinded, they've been given their sight. The Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles, the fullness of it has come. Time, God says, time no longer, this is it. This is the, this is the, the, the beginning now of when all the kingdoms of the earth become the property of one Jesus Christ. And so right after that, you have the seven vials of wrath. By the time, and while I'm saying that, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. Now begins the vials of wrath. 
when the earth gets to the time of the vials of wrath, when the wrath of God begins, there's no stopping it. When God poured out wrath like rain upon the earth in the days of Noah, there was no stopping it until it was done. Okay? So, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it tells us, verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But then it says to us, verse 5, year, or verse 4, You are not in darkness, brethren, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That's another reason why I believe it won't be that secret. We'll all be mowing the grass or, you know, cleaning the house or watching a ball game or whatever. And all of a sudden we just disappear. You're all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Um, verse 9 then tells us, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord. So here's, here's, how, I, here's how I have to see it. At the, the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trump. And we don't know how long that trump lasts. We don't know. Because it mentions in chapter 10, verse 7, at when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. But then we have in chapter 11, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded. Now it's the end of the sounding, and now all the kingdoms of the earth are going to become Christ. Um, there, there is a time for the beast to rise up somewhere in here. I don't exactly know where. If I knew everything, I wouldn't be your pastor. No, uh, I don't know everything. But I, I have to take this at face value. I have to take it the way it says it. And I, I, I believe that the beginning of the sounding of the last trump is when we are translated into heaven. God then is going to, he has, uh, he has sequestered Israel. They are safe now from all harm, and he's going to begin to pour out vials of wrath upon the earth. We are not appointed unto that wrath. And uh, I know that doesn't square with the dispensational, pre-tribulational, pre-millennialist. And pre-tribulationalism is a wholly dispensational sourced doctrine. It comes from dispensationalism. Uh, in other words, they had to divvy up the Bible and cut it up into pieces in order for a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial rapture to occur. Um, because when you read the Bible as a whole, it doesn't work. It, there's nothing that tells you that that's how it's going to happen. Um, it's the idea that, and they, they, and I used to say this, I, I knew, I knew the doctrine because I taught it, I believed it at one point. But it's the idea that um, nothing bad will occur. There's no famines, no pestilences, no earthquakes in diverse places, no wars or rumors of wars. Nothing of that will occur. The first event to happen in God's calendar, they say this over and over again, is the rapture. That's the first event to happen in God's calendar. And, they, and because one man said that 75 years ago, thousands of them say it now. They all say the same thing, even though they have, they have no... Biblical basis to base it on whatsoever. Um, they also are looking for, we know that the Antichrist will make a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. That will begin, and then the rapture will occur. The Bible didn't say that either. And so, I just decided to not believe what the Bible didn't say and believe what the Bible did say. So, yeah, I heard John. He heard me barking down here. Roo, 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 roo. And John said, Amen. So, uh, let's see here. I, that's about all I'm going to do tonight.